Tynemouth Castle is located on a rocky headland, known as Penbal Crag, overlooking Tynemouth Pier. The moated castle towers, gatehouse and keep are combined with the ruins of the Benedictine Priory, where early kings of Northumbria were buried. The coat of arms of the town of Tynemouth still includes three crowns, commemorating the tradition that the Priory had been the burial place for three kings. King Edward's Bay is a small sandy bay enclosed by cliffs and grassy banks, and as such is an excellent environment for family use. The beach is at the foot of Tynemouth Priory and Castle, a historic site run by English heritage. The bay is only a short walk from Tynemouth Front Street and is a blue flag and seaside award-winning beach. It is a perfect place to sit and relax on a hot summer day. With all of Tynemouth's cafes and shops right on the beach's doorstep it really is ideal for families. Dogs are banned on the beach, and the RNLI have beach lifeguards operating during the summer months. The creamy yellow rocks of the coastal headland that is variously known as the Hugh, Penbal Crag or Benable Crag, are the same coastal rocks found across the tide to the south. The geologically unique stretch of coastline from Hartlepool to South Shields is formed by magnesian limestone, and the outcrop of Tynemouth on the north side of the river is an isolated example outcrop of this familiar yellow stone. It is the same stone that forms the coastal rocks of Marsden near South Shields, and those rocks can be clearly seen on the horizon from the crag. The view from Tynemouth Castle and Priory is superb, particularly for those with a passion for the region's history. Below the walls and towering cliffs is a beautiful, if tiny beach tucked into a cove, while further north are the longer sweeping beaches of Colocos and Whitley Bay, with the lovely St. Mary's Lighthouse and its island close by. Further north still towards Bly is an offshore wind farm. To the east are panoramic views of the sea and sky and to the south, the mouth of the Tyne itself, with its entrance marked by the North Pier and its more southerly counterpart across the river. It is believed that at the time of Robert Mowbray's capture in 1095, there was a castle on the site consisting of earthen ramparts and a wooden stockade. In 1296 the Prior of Tynemouth was granted royal permission to surround the monastery with walls of stone, which he did. In 1390 a gatehouse and barbican were added on the landward side of the castle. Much remains of the priory structure as well as the castle gatehouse and walls which are 3200 feet 975 meters, in length. The promontory was originally completely enclosed by a curtain wall and towers, but the north and east walls fell into the sea, and most of the south wall was demolished, the west wall, the gatehouse and a section of the south wall, with original wall walk, remain in good condition. Earl Tostig made Tynemouth his fortress during the reign of Edward the Confessor. By that time, the priory had been abandoned, and the burial place of St. Oswin had been forgotten. According to legend, St. Oswin appeared in a vision to Edmund, a novice, who was living there as a hermit. The saint showed Edmund where his body lay and so the tomb was rediscovered in 1065. Tostig was killed at the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066, and so was not able to re-found the monastery as he had intended. In 1074 Walthy of II, Earl of Northumbria, last of the Anglo-Saxon Earls, granted the church to the monks of Jero, together with the body of Saint Oswin, Oswin of Dera, which was transferred to that site for a while. In 1090 Robert de Mowbray, Earl of Northumberland, decided to re-found Tynemouth Priory, but he was in dispute with William de Street Calais, the Bishop of Durham, and so placed the priory under the jurisdiction of the Priory of Saint Albans. 
monks were sent from St. Albans in 1090 to colonize the new monastery. However, when the abbot of St. Albans visited in 1093, Prior Thurgood of Durham met him and prevented the usurpation of the rights of Durham. In 1091, seamen from William II's ships plundered Tynemouth, and one victim appealed to St. Oswin, whose shrine was in the Priory, and the next day the ships were all lost on the rocks of Coquette Island in fair weather. Thereafter, William Rufus held St. Oswin in great reverence. In 1093 Malcolm III of Scotland invaded England, and was killed at Annick by Robert de Mowbray. Malcolm's body was buried at Tynemouth Priory for a time, but it is believed that he was subsequently reburied in Dunfermline Abbey, in Scotland. In 1095 Robert de Mowbray took refuge in Tynemouth Castle after rebelling against William II. William besieged the castle and captured it after two months. Mowbray escaped to Bamborough Castle but subsequently returned to Tynemouth. The castle was retaken and Mowbray was dragged from then imprisoned for life for treason. In 1110 a new church was completed on the site. At the end of the 19th century the castle was used as a barracks with several new buildings being added. Many of these were removed after a fire in 1936. The castle played an important role during World War II XI when it was used as a coastal defense installation covering the mouth of the River Tyne. It also suffered heavy air raids in 1941. The restored sections of the coastal defense emplacements are open to the public. These include a guard room and the main armory where visitors can see how munitions were safely handled and protected. Ships can be seen coming and going, watched over by the knowledgeable guiding eye of Admiral Collingwood, the hero of Trafalgar, from his commanding monument. Across the river the view from Tynemouth encompasses South Shields, with the winding Tyne disappearing into the distance as it twists and turns creating the illusion of riverside cranes stranded inland. On distant hilltops we see Penshaw Monument, the water tower at Cleedon and along the coast, the white and red coastal landmark of Souter Lighthouse. Much closer at hand and along the river to the east is North Shields, a port first developed by the monks of Tynemouth Priory, and now a docking point for freight ships and passenger liners bound for Amsterdam. Finally on the immediate east side of the lofty headland crag is the charming little town of Tynemouth itself, with its elegant Georgian and Victorian street leading up to the gateway of the castle, on the edge of its moat-like embankment. Although the picturesque ruins, coastal cove and views are the highlights of Tynemouth, the little town itself is a place of great charm. The town or large villages centered on Front Street and for centuries consisted of little more than this street, though it was joined around 1800 by neat terraces such as Newcastle Terrace, Allendale Terrace and Bath Terrace and others of later years. Front Street is noted for its cafes and restaurants, including a fish and chip shop where the legendary guitarist Jimi Hendrix came to eat in 1967. Close by at the eastern end of Front Street near the entrance to Tynemouth Priory is a small ornate Gothic clock tower of 1861. The town's most prominent monument, not including that of Collingwood down by the river, is that depicting Queen Victoria on the edge of the little village green, where Front Street splits into Manor Road and Huntingdon Place. The statue of the seated queen dates from 1905. Huntingdon Place leads to one of Tynemouth's most notable buildings, the railway station of 1882. Opened in 1882 for the Victorian ledger trade that brought Tynesiders flocking to the seaside, it is noted for its ornate interior of Victorian ironwork that would not look out of place in a museum. Now a station for the Tyne and Ware Metro, it is probably the best way to arrive in the town, particularly on weekends when it hosts its own flea market.
for some time a navigation light, in the form of a coal-fired brazier, had been maintained on top of one of the turrets at the east end of the Priory Church. It is not known when this practice began, but a source of 1582 refers to the keppage of a continual light in the night season at the east end of the Church of Tynmouth Castle, for the more suffigate of such ships as should pass by that coast. As Governor of Tynmouth Castle, Henry Percy, 8th Earl of Northumberland is recorded as having responsibility for the light's maintenance, and he and his successors in that office were entitled to receive dues from passing ships in return. In 1559, however, the stairs leading to the top of the turret collapsed, preventing the fire from being lit. In 1665, therefore, the then Governor, Colonel Villiers, had a purpose-built lighthouse erected on the headland, within the castle walls, using stone taken from the Priory, it was rebuilt in 1775. Like its predecessor, the lighthouse was initially coal-fired, but in 1802 an oil-fired argon light was installed. In 1841 William Folk, a descendant of Villiers and his successor as governor, sold the lighthouse to Trinity House, London. On the establishment of a lighthouse at Souter Point in 1871, the Tynemouth light was altered to display a revolving red light, rather than revolving white. It remained in operation until 1898, when it was replaced by Street. Mary's Lighthouse in Whitley Bay to the north, Tynemouth Castle Lighthouse was then demolished. Tynemouth Castle and Priory is now managed by English Heritage, which charges an admission fee between 5 to 10 pounds. In 2002, it doubled as a castle for a tourist advert for the Isle of Mull. Further details are available in the website, link in description. If you enjoy this video please like it, share it and subscribe to our channel.